Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Lauren LaPuma. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. All right. Well, hi, Lauren. Hi, Shane. Uh, it's, it's it's nice to just uh, be the two of us for, for today. I know. Uh, we haven't done any an episode, just the two of us in a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and folks who actually listen to this on a regular will probably realize that we didn't have a cold open either. But there's a reason for that. So we just want to get straight into it with a special treat today. We uh, talked with Leland Melvin, who is a former astronaut, a former NASA astronaut, and a former professional football player, which is already quite the resume, uh, who's speaking at our AGU fall meeting this year, virtually, of course. Uh, And Lauren and I spoke with him about this unusual life and career path that he had. Yeah, it's so interesting. Leland is the only person ever to have been drafted into the NFL and who also flew in space as an astronaut. It's pretty cool. (laughs) You know, the, the sad part actually is that Leland suffered some injuries after he was drafted and he didn't play in any regular season NFL games. But his athleticism and his experience playing football really like contributed to his success at NASA when he became an astronaut. Yeah. And so before the astronaut or before he was an astronaut, he actually came to NASA as an engineer. But after some encouragement, uh, he applied to be an astronaut and was accepted. And so during a training exercise, actually, Leland lost his hearing and he was actually medically disqualified to fly in space. But that did not dissuade him. And once his hearing returned, albeit partially, but he ended up flying two missions to the International Space Station. Yeah, it's such a cool story. Leland is such an inspiring person. One kind of theme of his life that really stuck with me when we were talking to him was how he just kept going in the face of defeats or obstacles. It was really a tale of overcoming odds. And so I am so excited to share with this with all of you, for all of you to hear his story. So here we go and enjoy. My name is Leland Melvin. I'm a former NASA astronaut and STEAM explorer. Oh, well, I grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, and my mother, you know, she always gave me things that would, uh, you know, spark my curiosity. And one of the things that she gave me was a agent appropriate non OSHA certified chemistry set where I, (laughs) I, she said, Leland, I want you to, you know, follow the instructions and have fun. But I took the instructions and threw them over my shoulder and created them this most incredible explosion in her living room. And I burned a hole in her carpet and she had a hand in my development. And it's, that's, where I, that's where it got started with science. And then with, um, you know, the mechanical engineering type stuff was with my dad when he, he drove a bread truck. That, well, he drove, yeah, this Marita bread truck he drove into the driveway. And he said, uh, I thought I was going into the bread business. You know, I was be delivering out the side of this truck and running around. But he said, no, this is our, this is our camper. I said, no, dad, I can read. It says Marita bread and rolls on the side of this thing. And we, over that summer, we built this thing out. You know, we built bunk beds, mechanical engineering. We Coleman stove with, you know, chemical engineering and then electrical wiring, electrical engineering. I was learning how to be an engineer. I didn't even know it. And we were having fun. And it wasn't until we painted the truck that I realized the vision my dad had for his family was to use this as an escape pod from this this, you know, somewhat sometimes racist town in Lynchburg, in the South, in Lynchburg, Virginia, to, you know, nature, the Smoky Mountains, Virginia Beach, other places. And, and I, and I think that was where I got this curiosity for, you know, looking up at the night sky and the mountains and seeing, you know, nothing but, you know, pinpricks and velvet with stars shining through and, and just this, you know, curiosity about the world around me, even though I didn't want to be an astronaut. I didn't, you know, in five five years old, when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon, I was like, I don't want to do that, you know? You know, I don't have a crew cut and be this white <laughs> dude. And, you know, it was just, it didn't, I didn't connect with it. And, um, and I- What really, did you think you wanted to do then? Or did yeah, you know? Um, I was- I was always curious in building things, you know, but 
my dad talked about this person um, down the street from where we where I grew up um, on Pierce Street, and it was Arthur Ashe, the tennis player, trained down there. Oh wow! And Arthur Ashe, um, as, as many of you know, he won every single tournament. He was he was intelligent. You know, he played in college. He was um, had great character, great stamina, athleticism, all these things that my dad talked about his his character and his all the attributes that defined him. And he looked like me, you know? <laughs> so um, so the, the backstory around that though, is that this, this house where he was trained by this guy named um, Dr. Whirlwind Johnson. Dr. Johnson was the first African-American doctor who, who integrated the hospital where I was born. Wow. And before we moved to this house on Pierce Street, we lived in Dr. Johnson's apartments. So I was a little small kid, you know, I mean, I was like born living in the man's apartments who taught Althea Gibson and Arthur Ashe how to play tennis. And so the storied legacy of this street that had all these people, Chauncey Spencer, who helped help grow the Tuskegee Airmen. He wow. lived on that block also. And then his his mother, Ann Spencer, who was a world renowned Harlem Renaissance poet. So. This street had so much storied legacy. And then I was able to glean from these, you know, legendary people and then be able to find space from their commitment and sacrifice to allow, you know, all people to, to rise. Growing up, what kind of path did you think your life was gonna take? I mean, you had all these amazing inspirations around you. I mean, where did you kind of see yourself going with it, you know, or going with science or athletics? athletics? Yeah, I mean, I you know I played football. I, I did, I blew things up with chemistry. So I I knew that I could be a scientist. I'd already already done it. Just I just needed some some goggles and a and a you know and a white lab coat. And uh, and you know my my mom she was a home economics teacher. So there was chemistry in preparation of food. You know, and my dad was a language arts teacher, but I didn't really know any. I guess my chemistry teacher in high school was a, you know, she was a scientist, but I didn't really know a lot of scientists and engineers. Um, but I, but I was always curious and I always like building things and creating things. And, and so that kind of led me down the path in college to, you know, being a chemistry major. Um, and, uh, so it was, it was kind of, you know, this circuitous path, this journey of, of hard knock sometimes and, and discovery. You were pursuing a very serious, scientific, course-heavy, intensive degree while also being a student athlete. Was that relatively unique? Did your your teammates think you were um, misguided for doing that? Like, yeah. what was that experience like? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it, it wasn't your typical dumb jock, you know, degree. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I when I signed the letter of intent to be an athlete at the University of Richmond, the first thing I told the coach was that I want to major in chemistry. Can I major in chemistry? and play football, you know, at this level. And he mm -hmm. agreed to me that, you know, I could do both. And so there were, you know, during the season, there were many times when, you know, I would have to miss practice, the hard practices, the Tuesday and Wednesday practice to go to chemistry lab. And I may, I may come out to practice for 15 minutes at the end and break everyone down. And so he held up to his end of the bargain. Um, but a lot of coaches don't allow, you know, their players, they try to get them to go to a different class, but at a small university like Richmond, there weren't that many lab classes. So you had to take that lab or you would have to take it the next year. And that would have, you know, pushed my, my schedule out for graduation. So, so I had, I had a coach who believed in, in education first and then athletics second, and there were other, other football players. And I know that there's, there's been more since. But uh, Randy Randy Kinsley was in biology as a doctor now. Mm -hmm. um, we had a few other guys that were, you know, taking some of the sciences and things. So, but I know now that it's it seems like there are more student athletes at Richmond that are, you know, doing things. And I think because of that legacy of setting that stage for, hey, this guy played football and he was a chemistry major. Now he went to space, you know. So, sure. um, and there's a there's a huge picture of me. Um, in my astronaut uniform with the football team, it's one of the pictures that they see when they when they walk to the locker room. So I think That's this great. setting that setting that tone, uh, that bit in people's minds that you can do both if you have the right support, the right access, and the right opportunity. 
So you got your chemistry degree, and but you decided to play professional football. Tell us about that. Well, I, uh, you know, I, I got drafted to the Detroit Lions in the eleventh round, the nineteen eighty six college football draft, and I get this phone call at like eleven o'clock at night, and there's this guy who says, "Hey, uh, we're going to draft you in the eleventh round. Do you want to play for the Detroit Lions?" Sure, right? You know, <laughs> who, who gets drafted to the Detroit Lions in the eleventh round? Um, and so I, you know, it was an opportunity and I always, I always like look at opportunities as a way to learn new things. And, and so I, I went to training camp. Um, I came back, I graduated and then I went to the full up camp and I pulled a hamstring in, in training camp. And I, I, you know, they cut me from the team. Um, I started graduate school at the university of Virginia after that. Um, really I, I started as a research assistant in between the camps of Detroit and Dallas and I was doing electrochemistry research. And when the January, when January came around to, to the start of the master's degree program, uh, the professor said, hey, well, why don't you, you know, roll in the master's program at University of Virginia in material science? I'm like, well, you know, I'm leaving in three months to go play for America's team, you know, in the NFL, the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> and he said, well, just let's do it anyway. So I enrolled and started taking two courses, math and material science and, uh, and electrochemistry. And when I left to go train with Dallas in March, this is the online learning. They videotaped the courses, VHS, okay? <laughs> you know, these big tapes that they were mailing to me down in Valley Ranch in Dallas. And so by day, I'm catching footballs for America's team at night. I'm watching VHS videotapes. I had to watch, I think, 15 tapes before I took my final exams. And that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Oh my God. But, did um, but did we, you feel overwhelmed or were you like, this is awesome? It was, it was, you know, again, getting back to that balance between academics and athletics. I mean, this was at a whole nother level, um, you know, with, with their expectation that you're, you're there to play professional football. You're not here to get a, a degree, but I think a lot of other guys, in the off season, you know, they went to law school, they did, went to business school. And so there was this expectation that you could do other things while you were practicing. And, and I, you know, I got a chance to play in two preseason games with the Detroit. I got pulled the hamstring for the second time at Dallas. And so that was the end of my football career, but I went back to grad school and then, you know, whatever former NFL player does, they go work for NASA, right? <laughs> just like just like all the rest of them. I mean, yeah. when when you realized your football career was over, were you disappointed or were you kind of like ready for the next chapter? How are you kind of feeling about that? Yeah, good question. I um you know, I mean, I, I once I got in it, I wanted to play. Um but then I saw some of the other things that were going on and people getting injured but then having no other options, so they were playing injured, they were hurt, you know, people, you know, taking all kinds of, you know, pain kill. And it's different, different scenarios for different people. And, and, uh, and now with, you know, CTE and all the things that are happening, I think, you know, maybe I, I, you know, this, I wouldn't have never got the space if I stayed in the NFL probably. So, um, but I think this was, this is what my journey was supposed to be. Right. So um, I was probably disappointed for a couple of days, but then, you know, I said, well, life goes on, keep moving on. And, and find something something different. So what was that? What was that process like, at least in your mind, when you you so you were done with the Cowboys and then you ended up going to NASA? But how I'm just interested in how that shook out. So the way it played out, I got cut from the Dallas Cowboys. We were training out in California, Thousand Oaks, California. Um, I called my agent. He was going to try to find me another place, but then I was already in graduate school at UVA. So I just went back to school, finished my master's degree, went to a career fair. And, uh, it, I was in Charlottesville at this career fair and I'm walking by the different booths. And I was one, I wanted to go work for DuPont or Dow, you know, chemical, mm -hmm. they, they had great positions and, you know, and I, I thought I would, I would do that. They paid well. And then this woman comes up and grabs my arm. She's standing at the NASA booth. And she says, what's your name? I said, Leland Melvin. She says, I've been looking for you. You're going to work at NASA. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not working for NASA. And so she, so the career fair is winding down and she grabs my arm. She says, come on, you're going to help me take these books to my car. And so I'm talking to her about NASA, helping her break down her booth. 
And it's just like, what is going on here? You know, I didn't come here to work, you know? And so um, her name is Rosa Webster. She was a physicist. She was there when Katherine Johnson was there. She was, you know, the woman who helped calculate the trajectories to get, you know, um, John Glenn to space and to help me ride in the space shuttle, you know, just all these incredible calculations that were, de you know, de depicted in, in the movie Hidden Figures. And, and, and she said, you know, you can get your PhD. We'll pay for you to go back to school, get your PhD. You can work here. It's a very collegial atmosphere. You can do research. And so I went down and interviewed at NASA and not thinking that I would, I would do it, but I know I, I realized that, you know, this is a really interesting place and the money was very different from, you know, working in the private sector. And so I was thinking about, you know, the dollars, but then I thought about the opportunities to get my PhD. And, um, and so I went and took the job in the non-destructive evaluation sciences branch. We were, we were doing research to develop sensors to make uh, strain and temperature and just different types of measurements on, um, on aerospace vehicles. So non-destructive testing or smart materials, smart structures. And, and I really enjoyed that. And then I went, I went to work on my PhD at University of Maryland in, in mechanical engineering, which was a, a rapid departure from material science and chemistry. And so to do that, I had to go to Old Dominion University, which was near NASA Langley Research Center. And I took um, some introductory courses in mechanical engineering and some more mathematics courses to prepare me to go into that to that program. And for whatever reasons, you know, during that program, I, I just didn't feel like it was time for me to be there doing that. So I spent a year at Maryland um, taking these courses and then I went back to NASA Langley. And I became the program manager of this, this program called the X33 program. We were going to develop sensors to make measurements on these cryogenic tanks on this, on this vehicle. And I thought, wow, this is really exciting. And I was traveling around the country, working with all these teams of engineers and astronauts, I mean, engineers and scientists from all over the country to build this vehicle. And then as I was doing this work, people at NASA you know, at, at NASA Johnson, at NASA Kennedy Space Center, they found out about these potential sensors that can make measurements for detecting uh, hydrogen leaks or oxygen leaks on the space shuttle. And so we did a project with them. Um, and then my friend said, Leland, you'd be a great astronaut. And he handed me an application. And I looked at it and I didn't fill it out. I said, I, I can't be an astronaut. Come on, you know, whatever. And that same year, another friend of mine who worked on that same X-33 program, Charlie Camarda, he filled the application out and he got in. And I said to myself, wait a minute, NASA let that knucklehead become an astronaut? <laughs> wait, wait a minute, that guy. And, and the thing that happened between that revelation of him getting in and me applying was that he flew a NASA T-38, it was a high performance military training jet from Houston to NASA Langley. There's an Air Force Base beside our Langley, um, NASA Langley, uh, Langley Air Force Base. And they landed there and I went out to the plane and met them. And the person that stepped out of the plane with him was John Young. John Young walked on the moon. Wow. And so I, <laughs> So Charlie and John Young are over in the conference room and I'm giving them a talk about the research I'm doing that can help the space shuttle. And John Young falls asleep during the entire session. He wakes up, turns to Charlie and says, Charlie, let's get back to Houston. I want to get back home. But then he turns to me and he says, Leela Melvin, you're doing some great research. It's going to help us with the space shuttle program. Really proud of you. You should probably become an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh my goodness if john young tells you to apply to become an astronaut a man who's walked on the moon you know you know maybe you should do it and so i applied and um when i went down for the interview john young was on the selection committee and when i sat down in the seat to to start the interview process you know there were astronauts and administrators and people all around the table and i'm sitting there and john young starts with you know, guys, Lila Melvin, he's worked at NASA Langley. He was an NFL football player. 
He's got the right stuff. Listen to what he has to say. He's a smart guy. So that set the tone for my interview. And, uh, and you know, that was my first application to become an astronaut, and I got in. And uh, so I think everything had aligned just right. I had left that PhD program to come back and work the vehicle health monitoring for the X-33. So I think, you know, sometimes as we go through our journey, we really have to listen to our, our inner self and our, you know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What is our purpose? You know, and that, I think that really resonated with me that making that decision and NASA was paying my salary and paying for school. So many of my friends said, what are you doing? You know, this you can get your degree and get paid. What is wrong with you? You know, but it didn't, it wasn't, the timing wasn't right for whatever reason. And so, uh, you know, as I, as I talk to you guys and I talk to the rest of people listening to this podcast, you know, make, make sure that you're doing, you're being very intentional about the, the decisions that you make so that you're doing what's right for yourself, for your family, for the community, for the planet, you know, for the universe, because it's, it's really important that you are, you're connected in a way that's, it's meaningful for you, not just doing something that other people feel you should do or, or, you know, your family wants you to, oh, you should go make all this money and do this thing, or you should do that, you know, do what you feel led to do. How do you think your, uh, your kind of athletic and, and professional um, athletic career affected your, um, I guess, ability to be an astronaut? Yeah, the, I think any, any time you're on a team, um, no matter what kind of team it is, you're doing usually things greater than what your individual self can do. And so whether it's an academic team, whether it's a research team, an engineering team, um, you, you learn how to coexist with other people to solve problems, whether it's getting the win or building a space station. And I think the other part of, of athleticism or training on a team, like an athletic team, is that you get this, this cadence of discipline, you know, and order and having to be in the right place at the right time, because that trajectory of the ball is going to be at that spot, whether you're there or not. Mm -hmm. And so these, the synchronicity of timing and, and, and pace and meter and, and, and that, that part. And then the part about being so tired that you want to quit and, and mentally tired, physically tired, that you're ready to give up, but you keep going for whatever reason. All of those micro training sessions that build to the macro training game and win have to do with conditioning your body and your mind to work at a high, high performing place, right? And so when I transitioned from athletics, you know, to, and we're, I'm always training, doing stuff with, with the astronaut corps, um, we're always working as teams. We're doing physical training, mental training, uh, spacewalk training is really hard. I mean, you're in that suit mm -hmm. for that long, the suit is pressurized, you're having to fight against it. So your, your body and your mind are working in concert to, you know, build this thing underwater. And I think the injury, um, part getting back to your question, the injury makes you come through something that's hard and painful. And, and I had that in, in athletics with, with my hamstring, mm -hmm. but also had it when, I was training to do my first spacewalk in this five million gallon pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. And as I went down in the pool, I didn't have a way to clear my ears because they forgot to put this little plastic Valsalva pad that allows you to press your nose against it to clear your ears. That was missing from my helmet. And so on that training event, I went deaf. I lost all my hearing. And when I came out of the pool, they took my helmet off, the flight surgeon touched my right ear, 
blood was coming out of my ear. I couldn't hear a thing. They did emergency surgery. They operated. They looked around. They couldn't find anything. About three weeks later, my hearing came back and my right ear only, only in the speaking frequencies. So I was medically disqualified to fly in space. And, and I had to, I had to go to a place of calm of, of, of kind of rebuilding of, of healing. And I, and to this day, many of the doctors or the audiologists don't understand how highly functioning my hearing is without hearing aids, because this ear is my left ear is pretty much gone. I mean, it's mm. down by probably a hundred DB and my right ear again is only the speaking frequency. So triangulation is a big problem for me. If the smoke alarm goes off, I mean, I, I can't tell exactly where it's coming from and they still let me fly in space because I had a person who believed in me. And as my, as I was, you know, my brain was kind of rewiring itself to hear again. I really believe that there are other transducers or sensors in my body that are, are being used for hearing versus touch or feel or temperature. You know, I think, I think I'm wired a little differently now so that I can, I can exist in a world of a hearing world or, or a world of, of, of noises that, you know, that hearing protects you from. Um, and I think I've become a lot more aware, you know, my visual acuity, you know, I, I've, I'm 56 years old and I, I don't wear glasses and I can still, you know, see. And so the, the optometrist always says, you can still read the chart, dude. What's, <laughs> what's up with that? <laughs> so, um, but I guess, you know, the body has a way of, of adjusting itself to, you know, coexist in a world that's trying to get you. And, um, and when I went to space, you know, there was a big concern that without having this left ear being functional, how is he going to do the job? How is he going to perform with alarms going off and things happening and people trying to tell you, hey, slow down on the robotic arm, you're going to run into something, you know, but I, I worked flawlessly because I trained, I trained, I trained and we worked as a team, you know, we, we, we took care of each other as a team to make sure that any deficiencies we had, we could, you know, fill in for each other. And, and that's exactly what happened. When I, when I installed this Columbus laboratory, it's a $2 billion laboratory to the space station. It was the first time that I was going to be flying the real robotic arm in space. I'd only trained in a simulator and everyone in Europe who was a, working this program depended on me to install this correctly or they would be without a job. <laughs> no, no pressure. Right? And, and so I, I remember knowing that I had to be perfect, that I had to, everything just had to be right. So when I trained on, in the simulator, I would sometimes close my eyes and put six degrees of freedom of motion into the translational and rotational hand controllers and to see if I was close to getting where I needed to be. So that if something did happen, you know, where I couldn't hear something or see something, I knew that I could do this and that deliberate training and also, you know, having the physical training from my, my athletic, you know, stuff to having body control and spatially knowing where that, that, that laboratory is, but also where your body is with respect to the hand controller so that, you know, you can keep yourself oriented in a way so that you're not going to make a, an error in the input that's going to cause that to, to veer off or something. The astronauts for Space Shuttle Atlantis's STS-122 mission flew into NASA's Kennedy Space Center on November 18, 2007 to participate in a launch dress rehearsal and other pre-launch activities. Known as the Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test, or TCDT, the Atlantis crew members had the chance to familiarize themselves with the equipment and payload they'll be working with in space on this 24th shuttle mission to the International Space Station. How are we doing today, Leland? In the pumpkin suit. Yeah. It's going pretty good. All right. Ready? Ready? Oh. Yeah, it feels nice and uh, nice and snug. I'm going to do some bailouts today. You see it's already hot in here in Houston.
And what was it like when you went on that first trip? Yeah, the um, the first trip to space was probably one of the most, um, I'm not going to say most incredible things I've done, but one of the most incredible sensory overload moments because you know you're you're launching you're shaking you're hearing all the sound of the engines and the rattling and the rumbling and at two and a half minutes the solid rocket boosters jettison and the ride gets smoother you're pulling three g's going through your chest so you're laboring to breathe and six and a half minutes later it's silent you hear the ground talking to you the things that you've dropped are now floating around you you under your five point harness seatbelt and you push yourself off with your back and now you're floating like these micro accelerations are moving you around in this cockpit of the of the space shuttle and i had to float over to the window with a video camera and film the the big orange external tank falling back down to earth to burn up and we filmed it because it was a witness plate for some foam had fallen off and maybe hit the hit the tiles on the wing or the, or the orbiter, because that's what happened in 2003 to my friends who died on the Space Shuttle Columbia. And so, you know, in launching, it was beautiful, it was momentous, but it was also a point of honoring the legacy of those people that had fallen. And when my friends died in 2003, I went to console David Brown's parents. He was one of the mission specialists in and his father said, my son is gone. There's nothing you do to do to bring him back. The biggest tragedy would be if we don't continue to find space to honor their legacy. And when I'm sitting in that rocket, I'm thinking about honoring the legacy. I'm not fearful. I've trained. We've got everything ready to go. Anything can happen. Something can happen with me leaving this studio and tripping on the curb and being checked out. But, you know, but to do something honorable, to honor someone's son and the crew, to help advance our civilization through exploration. You know, kind of what AGU does with people all around the world trying to make sure that we have a habitable planet and that we have a habitable place to for human beings to coexist. And so that's that's why I didn't have the fear. And I think, you know, the the athletic training, the NFL, the highly performing teams working together to get the win is something that was really I was really excited to be you know in and on and and proud to be representing you know the us to get to space with this international team of people working as a as a family and then one other last thing and so looking out the window after the tank fell down i needed new definitions of the color blue to describe what i saw in the caribbean azure indigo turquoise navy light blue i mean okay there's some other other ones in there but i needed it was so many shades so beautiful and i think that's one of the things that you're not prepared for from a sensory standpoint when you get to space is the is the beauty of our planet and and i think you know, looking at the Amazon burning, the fires in the Amazon, looking at the sediment coming down rivers from where places have been clear cut and the soil is eroding and coming and it's it 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 makes it it hurts your heart, but at the same time, it allows you to see it and then come back home with this new perspective and share it with others. Like I'm sharing it with you and like I'm sharing it, you know, with the AGU conference it's really important that we have the perspective of the bigger picture and how we all work and fit together as a, as one race, the human race, the family. You know, this year has been uh, it's really tough for so many people, but especially the kids that are having to learn from home and, and they're wondering, there are some that don't, didn't have a graduation, a, a high school or college graduation or any of these things. And so I, I think it's really important that for the future of humanity, you know, that we're all striving to fix now with our, our technical disciplines and our, our teams, it's so important to help inspire that next generation of explorers 
that comes from all zip codes or postal codes because there's talent in every postal code. We just have to make sure that that talent has access, opportunity, and belief. And when you put that belief in someone, you never know that a skinny black kid from a somewhat racist town with hearing loss, with abuse, with all these things can one day find space and have a different perspective for the universe. All right, folks. Well, that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thank you so much to Leland for sharing his story with us. This episode was produced by, well, us. <laughs> <laughs> AG would love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review this podcast. You can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or always at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time.